This is part one of our two-part interview with technical director Sean Tracy from Cloud Imperium Games. Even if you're not interested in Star Citizen right now, the interview should be pretty interesting because it contains information about 64-bit coordinates and world space and what is a 64-bit engine we talk about meshes and textures and mapping, all this stuff, load processing and management. Uh, before getting to this coverage, it is brought to you by Antec and their new Mini ITX Cube case designed by Razer. It's got an aluminum shell, acrylic windows on the sides, and it should be available shortly. So just as an FYI, part two of this interview will go up on Wednesday, and that will include the character technology that's been updated for CitizenCon, and also load management on the CPU, threading, things like that. So without further ado, I will let you get to part one of the interview. Hey everyone, we're here at the Cloud Imperium Games offices near Santa Monica in LA, I guess. I don't really know where we are anymore. <laughs> I'm joined by Sean Tracy from CIG, and we just talked with Chris Roberts, of course. So that video will be on the channel, now we're gonna be going more technical. Mm -hmm. So uh, the first kind of question to bring up, in our interview with Chris, he mentioned the concept of, uh, I used the word CryEngine. Yeah. Which got the response, well, it's not really CryEngine anymore. Yeah, right. So, so the, the working title we had then was Star Engine. So, yeah, so Star Engine's been kind of bounced around. I don't know how, uh, how absolutely official it is or anything like that, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's a pretty different version uh, than what the CryEngine is. We branched uh, quite a while ago, uh, so we haven't taken a new CryEngine version for quite some time. Um, it, it's the, about the 3.7, 3.8 area of CryEngine. So this was uh, this was early last year. It might have even been uh, before that, mm. uh, where we branched off. Um, so we branched off entirely uh, because it was getting really difficult to take the integrations. At this point, at some point when you're developing your game on middleware, you're gonna get to the point that pulling integrations is right. hard because you've customized it so much for your game. So whatever changes you make to underlying engine systems, when there's, when there's a fundamental change that comes in from your middleware provider, um, it's pretty difficult to consume that all the time. Mm. Uh, and then you start being selective. Okay, well, we'll, we'll take fe this feature, but we won't take this feature. And what you don't know right out of the gate is if there's any interdependency right. on it, what's gonna happen? <laughs> um, and then you find that out usually the hard way later on. Uh, so we tried to stop doing that. Um, uh, we do cherry pick on uh, on occasion from our uh, particular code base that we have um, up to, and again, I was pretty sure it was 3.7 or 3.8. Mm. I just can't remember the exact version. Number. Right. Um, but yeah, we've made some pretty pretty major changes, and uh, it's been ongoing for a while for CIG. Um, of course, uh, I only came on about two and a half years ago from Crytek after uh, supporting them with their engine drop right. versions. And as soon as they were done getting the engine, I'm like, all right, I better get over there. <laughs> you know? um, so one of the big fundamental changes, and, and Chris had mentioned it, uh, was the support for 64-bit positioning, right? Um, now, uh, what uh, a lot of people, um, I think, uh, maybe misunderstand is that it wasn't an entire conversion for the whole engine. Mm -hmm. um, the engine split up in a very independent and, um, you know, uh, not as much as they should be, but isolated modules, right? Um, they do talk to each other, of course, but uh, things like physics, things like render, things like AI, um, what are the purposes of changing the AI to 64-bit? Well, all the positioning that it will use will be changed right. to 64-bit, but the, the AI module itself doesn't really care, um, you know. So there was a lot of changes to support this large world um, coordinates. Um, and it's actually pretty crazy. I have it written up on my wall, the actual maximum. It's 18 zeros that we can support in terms of, uh, in terms of space, which is crazy because especially for... I guess that's a floating point limit or something at that yeah, point. Yeah, that's exactly <laughs> it. Yeah, and at that point, like, I mean, you just, you just can't have any more right. uh, within the memory. So uh, it's pretty weird for people that have, um, you know, come over from Crytek that have worked on just CryEngine normally, mm -hmm. because, I, and Chris had mentioned this, you're working on like a four to, I mean, maximum eight kilometers of level. Um, and already at that scale, I felt like that was pretty big. But when it's, it's such a, 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 you know, for lack of a better word, it just messes with your mind um, in the large world coordinates, because you'll be sitting there working on something and then you sort of start to zoom out and you're like, sort of start to zoom out <laughs> a bit more and you're like, hmm. Keeps and it just going. keeps going. Um, it really messes with your sense of scale, though, because um, uh, it can be pretty confusing. Again, if you're looking at a planet, like, I mean, you're looking at thousands of kilometers of, of, of area. Right. Um, so it can get very easy to 
underestimate how large the undertaking of just populating well, something of that area scale. Too, not just uh, exactly yeah. right. Um, so that can uh, that can really mess with your mind. But that's one of the bigger uh, bigger changes we made, of course, with the with the implementation of planets, but more just with the positioning of it, right? So uh, now I think in the the first system that we're gonna do. Um, and just right now, and this is maybe quantum travel speeds will change or so, but it takes about 45 minutes at our at our jump or quantum jump speed mm -hmm. to cross an entire system. So that's just one system. And if you want to think of the systems as levels, I guess in the in themselves, that's kind of how you would think about it. There right. would be basically no loading for you know 45 minutes of quantum travel, which is the actual realistic value of you know 0.2 c, which is the 0.2 times the speed of light, right. so it's, it's crazy how large that area is. It can, can really mess your mind when you're working on it in yeah. sandbox and stuff like that, so it is kind of cool. So the 64-bit conversion, again, uh, I guess the, the clarity to be made is that it's not the entire engine. That's so right, and it didn't need to be the entire engine, right? right? Um, so uh, yeah, that, that, that was the big piece of clarity, I think, and a lot of people have this understanding. They just, I, I think it's just easier to understand. Oh, yeah, they converted the engine to 64-bit. Right. Well, okay, you know, there was stuff within the engine that already was 64-bit. What we really needed was physics and positioning to be, right. um, and, and that's what got changed. So, And to, to put that into perspective for folks, the uh, world space coordinates is one of the big impacts from that. Mm -hmm. You've got more space you can work with. That's right. Is there anything else specifically that uh, you benefit from by making the conversion? Uh, to 64-bit? Yeah. Um, uh, not that I can think of right out of the gate. Um, it, no, it's more just supporting the actual space right. itself uh, more than anything. It's not better performance uh, right. or anything. Uh, if anything, it's a bit worse. Um, but, I mean, we're talking marginal differences right. like I mean um, it, yeah if anything it's a, it's actually a tiny bit slower uh, but with newer CPUs actually we did we did make a change to how the, the, the positioning works so mm. actually it ends up being faster but uh, normally if you were just gonna switch over to 64-bit um, uh, positioning you would be a little bit slower uh, in your math um, so the other the only benefits we get is just just the sheer amount of space right. that you can support for the players, and it, they have to have that amount of space um, for a game that's you know in space. Right, that makes sense. For uh, procedural gener generation mm -hmm. tech for the planets, mm -hmm. so procedural generation version 2.0 mm -hmm. is kind of the big topic. Yeah, right. There's there's a lot we can talk about here. Technically, sure. uh, we were talking with Chris, as I said. There's another video on that. Yep. So there's biomes. There's different, I guess, layers you yep. might call it for the biomes. So, uh, and sorry to interrupt you, uh, one of the things that we had done, um, and I, I, uh, the difference between the V1 and the V2 mm. planets, and uh, because I was sitting in the interview with Chris, uh, it wasn't super clear what the difference really was. Sure. So on, a, on the V1 planet, it was our very first implementation. Um, what you saw on our demos is actually just a single terrain layer, like it's one material. Right. Um, yes, okay, we've got different textures that are, that are, um, uh, that are blending at different distances and so, uh, but all the planets that we had shown literally only had a single material across the entire planet, which is pretty fake. I mean, that's that's not at all. And that's actually, in, in a lot of cases where you see procedural generation tech, it never goes beyond that. Mm -hmm. um, they're happy with just this uh, uh, one sort of rocky material, or whatever it happens to be across the entire planet. So what this does is it brings us way more in line with how we were making uh, crisis levels or, 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 or levels down at Crytek uh, with terrain because we always had access, or designers always, or artists always had access to up to 16 layers um, for different terrain textures. So what we want to do with it is kind of give them back that same ability just on a ridiculous scale. Uh, because again, you would, you know, and I, I thought it was a lot of time to, to paint eight kilometers of space and to paint, you know, again, like thousands and thousands right. of kilometers. It's crazy. Um, but yeah, we want to give them that amount of layers because that's the only way that you're going to get the quality that you want out of a first person shooter or anything like that. Um, you're never going to get that with just a single t sort of terrain layer. So another big improvement on the V2 planets is the biomes, of course. So on the V1s, uh, V1 planets, they had no biomes. There was no idea right. of that whatsoever. It's a single terrain layer. It's got the height map great. Uh, but on V2, we've got biomes. So the biomes themselves have layers within them for object placement, for weather, like Chris no uh, noted. Um, as well as uh, the vegetation and other objects that can right, be placed. Right, so on actually it. adding foliage now and things like that. Exactly, and then um, and, and and this this was one of the good reasons about coming 
from CryEngine anyways, we reuse and try to reuse as much as possible a lot of the really powerful tools that CryEngine already had um, for these things just at the bigger scale, right? So again, in the thinking of the terrain layers, well, terrain layers were the same way in CryEngine before, now let's just apply that to planets and you've got the same sort of ability, just work on a large scale, same thing with the vegetation. Um, I had noticed in the, uh, the conversation with Chris, uh, there's more advanced rule sets for vegetation. So. Mm -hmm. In, in Crisis, to give you kind of some, some history, we really only had like 16 different palm trees and like it did pretty well for entire forests and people were like, you right. know, whoa, that vegetation's amazing. Well, what was really good about it was the system that we used to place these. So we had uh, variable scale. We, we would set rule sets on, on like a little layer or a group um, for these vegetation objects. So again, we'll take this really powerful tool and apply it to the procedural stuff. So you'll do things like density. Okay, how, how close can other you know, palm trees be to this? Are they randomly rotated? Because that's, that's a really easy uh, win for a lot of things. So you mm. might have like this tree that's sort of rotated like this, right. right? And if that's placed, the same rotation everywhere, you're like, same asset. Right. But as soon as you randomly rotate it, a lot of people will be like, oh wow, there's that tree, there's that tree. That. It's all actually the same asset though. Right. Um, then you've got randomized scale uh, that'll happen between them. Uh, the density, random scale, and uh, whether it aligns to height maps. So like if the tree ends up on the side of a hill, does it go like this or does it go like this? Right, if it does it's it grass, correct. it's got to do that. But if it's a tree, it's got to go yeah. straight up. So there's a lot of things we learned in, in the crisis projects and just working on CryEngine generally that I think uh, we're applying to that tool set there so that it's just as powerful because a, 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 a mentality at Crytek was always use the tools to get you 90% of the way there and then mm. let the artists come in and do that last 10%. Right. So that's the exact same idea with these planets. We've got to have powerful tools because again, you've got you know, a thousand planets or whatever it's going to end up being. Um, how do we make all of those you know, in, in, uh, at, to a fidelity that, that um, you know, is it, we're all proud of, right? Um, but it doesn't take you know, not take ten years or eleven years to do it. So, so again, taking a lot of the tools from from CryEngine is is really one of the best things. So, a lot of people say, oh yeah, well, it's a crazy idea to go with CryEngine. Well, not really, because there was a lot of stuff in the engine that is very very powerful. Um, so, and we try well, it's, to use it's that basically stuff. your own engine now, anyway. Like we exactly. Were saying, so exactly, but it would be a shame to. Um, you know, just take all the old modules, delete. <laughs> you know, there's no right. reason to do that. We right. want to we want to try to save our time um, and uh, and build off of uh, of good tool sets that were already there. Right. So. Uh, so with the procedural generation stuff, like we said, multiple layers. Mm -hmm. We're talking about with Chris about how uh, you might have a forest layer yep. or a biome rather next yep. to some other neighboring biome swamp, something like that. Yeah. What what sort of parameters are in uh, when the system is looking at how to blend these multiple biomes, blending yes, each other? the edge blending, and that's right. actually something we're talking a lot about right now. Um, even just last week, we had a pretty large email that we were going back and forth on some things. So, uh, so whatever I answer right now, it could change. Guaranteed, this is going right, to change. Right. Um, so, I mean, the, the the thinking generally is right now, um, just like uh, Chris said, there's a distribution map, right? Mm -hmm. um, so you can either uh, use that to inform all your placement but then you don't really get perfected blends. What you can do is on those edges of the, of the clip mask, because you kind of, or not the clip mask, the distribution map, you, mm. you know where that ends. So you can actually do a certain distance that you're kind of calling a blend distance or whatever. So right. this is where uh, one is blending into the other. The problem is, is if you have a lot of biomes, the rules to blend those two are probably gonna end up pre being pretty different. Mm. Um, for terrain layer blending, it's pretty straightforward. We did that in, in, in the crisis games. That's a sort of a high pass technique of, you know, kind of, uh, uh, we have a detail map that's grayscale and then we have a low detail that's more color and it's just really easy to blend uh, two grayscale details together right, sure. uh, on top of, you know, just a base color. So terrain layers are probably going to be easy. It's the, it's the vegetation and, and like the actual assets themselves because again, if you're blending from desert to Jungle, eh, this is kind of easy, you know, just a little bit of grass at, uh, at the edges and then you start right. doing trees. But when you start doing like, uh, like a, a, a mountain sort of forest versus jungle uh, versus city, like what do you do? Mm -hmm. um, so it, a lot of the rules, again, um, is based on, that, uh, based on that distribution map, we're going to have a distance. And then that distance is going to be variable based on whatever biome is blending okay. to it. So right now we're trying to make it so that the rules are robust enough that we get the nice blends out of it, but not so complex that nobody will understand what's going on. Right. Right. Um, 
And that's, again, in the end, we have to give the artists and, and the environment designers some ability to go in and manually fix whatever that is. But we've got to be able to get it 90% of the way there, you know, with rules and right, then let right. them fix it on then. So, yeah, I realized it didn't go into super deep detail about that, <laughs> but it's kind of because, you know, we're still talking about exactly the right way to do it. But uh, what you'll see in the, in the CitizenCon demo for the V2 planets already has a lot of that blending in it. Uh, just not in terms of large objects right. and things like that. Yeah. So as always, uh, more information. We'll have an article below with kind of key talking points, things like that. Sure. And uh, I guess we might be seeing you guys at CitizenCon. Otherwise, we'll have coverage of it online separately. So awesome. tune in for that. Thank you for joining me, Sean. You're very welcome. It was fun. Yeah. We'll right. see you all next time.